Welcome back into the Tell Me Teaching Series as we continue in our series entitled, What is the Gospel? What is the Gospel? This is our eighth installment in answering the question in a multifaceted fashion because the Gospel is not just something that happened 2,000 plus years ago on the cross that would impact us some, sometime into the future when we enter eternity. The Gospel is also something that you and I live out today on a daily basis. So when we answering the question, what is the gospel? The gospel always starts out with the bad news, even though the word gospel means the good news. So I want to return back to that in our eighth session here, and that is that the word gospel literally means the good news, and it occurs 93 times, and I always go back to the foundation. It occurs 93 times in the Bible, exclusively in the New Testament. In fact, in the Greek language, it's the word evangelion. The gospel is the word evangelion, which where we, this is where we get our English words, okay, evangelist, evangel, uh, evangelical, and so forth. That's where we get these words from. Now, the gospel, broadly speaking, is the whole of scriptures, everything from Genesis to Revelation, Revelation back to Genesis, and more narrowly, okay, the gospel is the good news concerning Christ and the way of salvation. Now, the key to understanding the gospel, and I repeat again, is to know why it is the good news. Why is it the good news? And to do that, we must always, we must always start with the bad news. In fact, in the Old Testament, the law was given to Israel during the time of Moses. Now, the law, which what we know as the Ten Commandments, that was the law. Now, since then, since the, since the, giving, since the giving of the Ten Commandments, Israel then began to add a whole bunch of other rules and regulations and laws onto this. But the law was what God gave on Mount Sinai. And we know that as the Ten Commandments. We originally see it the first time is in Exodus chapter 20. The second time it appears in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 5. I want to draw your attention to Deuteronomy chapter 5 because I want you to understand okay, why the law was given. Now, the other issue you must also always understand and remember and repeat as you share with people is that it was, it was always intended, it was always intended, though when the law was given, to drive us, to drive people to God. It was driven, it was given to drive people to God. That's what it was done. It was given to drive them to God. Why? Because because it, it was an act of impossibility to fulfill the law. So it was a mechanism that God uses to drive people to himself because it's impossible to fulfill it in letter or in spirit. So I said to you that, uh, open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 1. I want to read that verse to you because you already know what the Ten Commandments are, so we don't have to do that part. But I want to, I want you to focus on, on the instructions, okay, that precede the actual giving of the Ten Commandments. This is the key to understanding the bad news in order for, in order, for, in order for us to, to embrace the good news. Notice this in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 1. He says, Then Moses summoned all Israel and said, said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the ordinances which I am speaking today in your hearing, that you may learn them and observe them carefully. Now, I want you to see this with me. Now, there are four words here. There's actually five, but there's four that I want to focus in on. And he says, Hear, O Israel, what? The statutes and the ordinances. So they were to hear to apply. The, the statutes and the ordinances. They were to understand them. They were to incorporate them into their, into their daily life. The statutes and the ordinances. Then, toward the, end of, uh, in, toward the end of verse 1, he says this. He says, The statutes and the ordinances which I am speaking today in your hearing, that you may learn them and observe them. So what we have is we have the statutes and the ordinances, and you have to learn them and observe them. And notice this, okay? So you have to put, you have to understand them, you have to incorporate them, you have to apply them, you have to live them out. This was by design the act of impossibility, both in letter and in spirit. So the law was designed to drive people to God. It's to you, it's, it's to drive them to God. That's what it's designed to do. Now, this was the bad news. This was clearly the bad news that you were not going to be able to fulfill it. 
So if you do, you must always understand the bad news first before we get to the good news. Otherwise, the good news stands in a vacuum unto itself and it means nothing. And I've shared this before. I don't remember now everything. For me, every, at this stage in my life, everything was just the other day, right? And so the other day, <clears throat> and this is months and months and months ago. Uh, in fact, now it's been over a year since I've gone to my cardiologist. Okay? Now I have a doctor who treats my heart and so forth. And, and in, in one of our visits, um, he told me that I was going to take this medication. And he told the nurse, you know, to begin to run an IV and so forth. And, uh, and I was going to take this medication. And so... And he went to attend to, he says, I'll be right back. He went to attend to another patient quickly and then come back to me. And so I said, whoa, whoa. I said, wait a minute. He came back and I said, and the, and the nurse came to me and I said, no. I said, I am not taking this medication. And she was taken aback. I said, you have to explain to me what this medication is for. And she, I, I, I must have caught her off guard because she looked, she said, what, what do you mean? I says, well, I says, I'm not taking any medication just because you and the doctor said I'm have to take it. I said, I need to understand why I'm taking it. Hmm? I said, you're telling me, you're telling me, that the, and I told her, I said, you're telling me that the medication is good news for me. And I said, okay, what's the bad news? And so when the doctor returned, and I said that to him, and he, he, he looked, he's a really tall doctor. I mean, I got to look up to the man. And, and he looked down at me, and he was just stunned. He said, well, you need this. And I said, oh, well, I understand you to what you're saying. I understand you're saying that I need it. Why? I'm not taking the medication until you explain it to me. And he paused. He, he took two steps back. And he said, well, and he gave me the bad news. Well, you have to do this. The, the medication is because in your heart, this, 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 this. And I went, thank you. I said, that wasn't complicated, was it? You're trying to give me medication that is good news, but I haven't understood what the bad news was. So you just walk down the street and the doctor says, take this and you take it? Really? I mean, have you lost your mind? So you have to understand the essence of the good news by way of the essence of the bad news. And that's the point here. So let's go back to verse 1 and understand this. He says, then Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes of the ordinances which I am speaking to you today in your hearing, that you may learn them and observe them carefully. Now, what you understand, you have to understand what the law is. Now, you remember a number of sessions ago, I took out a measuring stick, right? And I took out a tape measure, right? And the law can be thought of as a measuring stick, okay? And sin is anything that falls short of perfect according to that standard. If you don't meet the standard, you don't meet the standard. You can't hedge it. You either meet it or you don't. The righteous requirement. The righteous requirement of the law, okay, is so stringent that no human being could possibly follow it perfectly in letter or in spirit. And despite on the human realm, at this at this level, at this level of humanity, okay, despite all of our goodness or despite all of our badness in real, in, relative to each other, we are all in the same spiritual boat. Okay? We have sin, and the punishment for sin is death and separation from God and the source of life forever and ever and ever. Turn your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 23. Romans, chapter 3, verse 23. Now, I'm reading out of the New American Standard Version, so you may have the King James Version. You may have the New King James Version. You may have the NIV. You may have the Amplified. You may have the ESV. You may have many different versions of the Bible in the English language, okay? So whatever language you're tuning into, uh, just follow along. And I'm reading out of the New American Standard, and he says it this way. In Romans, chapter 3, verse 23, he says, he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In the in the Amplified version of the Bible, it says it this way: Romans three twenty three. Since all since all have sinned and are falling short of the honor and the glory of God, of which God bestows and receives. So the fact is that on that measuring stick, we don't measure up. We fall short. I don't care if it's one centimeter or one millimeter. If it's one inch, one eighth, one sixteenth. You fall short. And that's the issue about the law. That's the bad news. And so as a result, there is absolutely nothing that you can do 
to achieve sufficient righteousness or self-righteousness to be acceptable before God. So now, since the truth is, and now we have to comprehend, all of us are going to die. Did you hear what I said? All of us are going to die. And you go, well, Brother Eddie, you sound rather morbid when you say that. No, 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 no. The truth is, all of us are going to die. That's a reality. The question is, okay, is the question is when is that going to happen, and under what kind of circumstances you're going to die? Okay, it's really not that all, in, all all that important as much as the fact it's going to happen. It's going to happen, and when that happens, you and I have to now face the other side. Okay, and it's called eternity because you and I live in the temporal world. Okay, we're living in the in this temporal world right here on earth, and so now what happens? Do I depart to enter into the kingdom of God in paradise, in the presence of God, in His glory forever and ever, or do I depart to be separated from God, from His paradise, but present before God in a state of perdition, in a state of hell forever and ever? That's the question, okay? And so in order for us to go to heaven, in order for us to go to heaven, God, which is God's dwelling place, it's the realm, it's the realm of life and light, okay? Sin must, how, must sin in your life must somehow be removed or paid for. This is now as we begin to now shift from the bad news and we're headed to the good news. Okay? Now the law itself okay, established that the cleansing from sin can only happen through the bloody sacrifice of an innocent life. That's the only way it can happen. And that's very clear into the law. Open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 22. Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 22. And the question has been asked me, well, why do you repeat this over and over again? Because it is absolutely stunning. It is frightening. It is amazing. It is overwhelming to see how many people who tell me they're Christians and how many pastors tell me they're Christians have the inability to explain the gospel of Jesus Christ. How can that possibly be? But it is. In Hebrews chapter 9, we're told this in verse 22. And according to the law, one must almost say, all things are cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So now, the gospel, if we fast forward the tape from the law to the point of when Jesus lands, when Jesus walks on earth, okay, and he goes to the cross to die, okay, the gospel involves Jesus' death. Now remember that according to the law, okay, you had to have the bloody sacrifice of an innocent life. The only possible innocent life that ever walked on earth was Jesus the Christ. So the gospel involves Jesus' death, okay, on the cross as the sin offering to fulfill the law's righteous requirement. Let me show you this. Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Go with me to Romans chapter 8, please, and verse 3. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. And let's pick this up where we left off in our last teaching. It says this, Romans 8, 3. For what the law could not do, okay, Weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So you remember, you remember in the law, okay, in, the, in Hebrews chapter 9, 22, he says, And according to the law, one, must, one may almost say that all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So now here in Romans 8, 3, he says, For what the law could not do, that law which was the sacrifice of an innocent of an innocent animal, okay? A perfect without blemish animal, okay? Weak, weak as it was through the flesh that that is that is the flesh of the animal, okay? Then God had to do something. And he said sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. And and here's the here's one of the issues that we kind of lose sight of. Is the animal innocent? Yes. Uh, we, was he without blemish and stain and wrinkles and so forth? Yes, 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 yes. The problem was that the animal is not a human being. The animal did not live the life of a human being, okay? And the animal did not live a life as a human being without sin. That's the issue. 
So Jesus, so all all those sacrifices were sort of symbolic and something that would happen way into the future. Okay. So you have to crash this idea. Okay. Now, Christ is the only one who fulfills the law. Okay. Christ condemns sin in the flesh by doing three things, by three acts. Okay. Remember verse eight, verse three, Romans eight, for what the law could not do, and then you drop down to the set, to the middle of that verse, sending his own son in the likeness of sin of sinful flesh as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Okay, so here his so Christ condemned sin in the flesh by three acts. Number one, Christ pointed to sin and condemned it as being evil. Christ pointed to sin and condemned it as being evil. The animal sacrifice could not do it. Okay? The very fact, the absolute very fact that he never sinned points out that sin is contrary to God and to God's nature. Christ rejected sin. And by rejecting it, he showed that it was evil and, and that it was not to be touched. He condemned it as evil and unworthy of God and man. The second act is this. Christ secured. Christ secured what? Christ secured righteousness for all men. Why? Because all men come short of the glory of God. All men do not measure up perfectly to the measuring stick or to the tape measure. Or to the or to a complete righteousness, perfect righteousness of God. We just cannot do that. So when he came into the world, Jesus, he came with the same flesh that all men are born with. The same flesh with all of its the same desires, um, the same passions, uh, the same potential for evil. However, he never ever sinned. Not once. Therefore, he secured perfect righteousness, and because of his righteousness is perfect and, and ideal, it becomes the model and the pattern for all men. It stands for his righteousness and covers the unrighteousness of all men. His perfect righteousness overcomes sin and its penalty. It condemns sin. And to be noted that he condemned sin, what? Through the flesh. Through the flesh. That's how he did it. Therefore, all flesh finds his perfection, his perfection and ideal in his, in his righteousness and in his perfection. Now, how does flesh find its power? Okay. Well, all flesh finds its power in, right, to condemn sin in Christ in his ideal righteousness. Now, let me ask you, let me ask you, open your Bibles to the book of John chapter 8, the Gospel of John chapter 8, and look at this in verse, 20, verse 46. A Gospel of John 8, 46. Look what he says. Which one of you convicts me? Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? Who can condemn Christ of sin? Who can convict them of it? Now, you can accuse them, but can you convict them? And this was the problem that Judaism had to face. It accused Christ of all kinds of issues, and including blasphemy, but it could not prove it. Okay? It could not prove it according to the Word of God. It can only attempt to prove it according to its own rules and regulations. In other words, according to ecclesiastical teaching, not biblical teaching. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says this. Open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 5, 21, and it says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, I repeat, he, God the Father, made him, God the Son, Jesus the Christ, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It was the only way that we would have ever become righteous is through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not because of we have we have any righteousness on our own. Turn your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter four, please. Hebrews chapter four, verse fifteen. He says this. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. We do not have a high priest. Jesus Christ, 
was a high priest, is the high priest. We do not have a Jesus Christ who could not sympathize with our weaknesses. Of course not, because he lived this earth. He walked in this earth as a flesh, as a man, just like us. So he could sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who has been tempted in all things, and we, and as we are, yet without sin. That's the point. The animal is not tempted to sin. Okay? Jesus was tempted to sin, and he did not sin. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, Jesus, who was holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. It's the gospel is always a person, the person of Jesus Christ. That's why we point them to him, to Jesus and what he did on our behalf. Because by definition, you and I were incapable and still incapable of, of perfectly fulfilling the law. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9. And in Hebrews chapter 9, I want you to see this in verse 14. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered, offered, and the word there is, is prospero in the Greek language, prospero, P-R-O-S, P-R-O-S-P-H-E-R-O, P-R-O-S, P-H-E-R, prospero, okay? And it says, his spirit offered prospero, himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now, this word to offer or prospero, okay, it, it means to take and present to God, to take and to present to God, okay? So the blood of Christ takes the sins of man and presents it to God. Mm -hmm. and, and to offer the most, and is to and, and, and what it means, it means to offer the most excellent gift to God. He offered the most perfect and holy gift to, to, to the Father, of which is what was Himself. So now He becomes the sin offering. He takes our sin upon Him, and He offers Himself to the Father. That was the perfect gift to God to pay for the penalty of our sins. Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit in the voice of the Apostle Peter. Open your, open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. But with precious blood, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ, because that's what he was and what he still is. In, turn your Bibles in that same book, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 22. Now, I realize that this is rather, this is rather elemental, infantile, okay? This is rather basic, but we need to grasp the basic. We need to understand it. There is no self-righteousness in man in order to get credit before God. <coughs> Excuse me. So in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, he says this, Who committed no sin, speaking of Jesus, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. No sin was found in his mouth. He was unblemished and spotless. The perfect sacrifice. Now listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit in the voice of the Apostle John. Turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. And look at this. And you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Why did Jesus come to earth? Why was he birthed? He came with a specific mission. You know that he appeared here in verse 5, 1 John chapter 3. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins. That was his mission. His mission was to be born to die, to take away the sins, and in him there is no sin. Now this word to take, 
Okay. Now I want you to underscore that here in a, at least in the in the New American Standard Version. He says, and you know that he appeared in order to take away. That word take. The word there in the Greek language is aero. Aero A I R O. A I R O. And really the action is on the O. Aero, okay? And it's um in this word it means it this word means to remove. It means to lift up and to carry away. It means to lift up and to carry away onto himself. So he took your sins. He took my sins. He took our sins. He took it from us, lifted it up, and carried it onto himself. Now the picture here, okay, is that is being painted is of a dead man. It's a dead man, okay, lying down, and his sin is removed from him, and as a consequence, he's raised to newness to newness of life. So if you could just just symbolically, if you could picture a dead man is laying down, okay, Jesus comes and he picks up and he removes his sin from him and takes it onto himself, and that dead man is raised back to life. That's the picture that we, that is being drawn. That's what happened to you and I when we were born again. The Bible says that you and I were dead in our trespasses. We were dead in our transgressions. We were dead in our, in our sin. We just didn't know we were dead. Now, this is the third thing that you have to grasp, okay? Here's the third thing you have to grasp, okay? Because we were talking about this, and I want to go back because um, we um, we t we said that sin condemned Christ. I mean, sin condemned sin. Christ sin. I'm sorry. Christ condemned sin in the flesh by three acts. Number one, Christ pointed to sin and condemned it as a being evil. Number two, Christ secured righteousness for all men. That's where we've been all, all this time. Now we come to the third act. The third act. Okay. Christ allowed the law of sin and death. Remember that teaching from our previous session. The law of sin and death. Now, Christ allowed the law of sin and death to be enacted to be enacted upon him instead upon the sinner. And so Christ said, shift the law of sin and death from mankind, shift it onto me. Okay? Man has sinned. Man has sinned, so the natural consequences is corruption and death. However, Christ intervenes. Christ approached God and made two requests from God the Father. Christ approached God and made two requests from the Father. First, he asked God to accept his ideal righteousness for the unrighteousness of man. Did you hear that? God accept God. He asked Jesus as God to accept his ideal righteousness for the unrighteousness of man. And secondly, he asked God to lay man's sin and death upon himself. He asked God to let him bear the law of sin and death and to experience hell for man. He asked God to let him to, he asked God to let him condemn sin and death in his own body upon that tree. Okay, the cross. Now turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And look at this. And everybody, you know, and look at he says, and in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, he says, And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. Okay. Now that word bore, when he says, and he himself bore, underscore that word, that word bore, okay, that word in the Greek language is anaferro, anaferro in the, in the Greek language is A-N-A-P-H-E-R-O, A-N-A-P-H-E-R-O, anaferro, it means to personally take on to himself. And he himself bore, he personally took it on to himself. Why? Because Jesus was the perfect, ideal man that sacrificed to be to go to the cross. Therefore, he could bear all of the violations of the law and all of the experiences of death for all men. God so purposed, if I can use it, if I can say it that way, God so purposed and God bore the awful price of having to condemn sin and death and in the death of his very own son. Sin and his power have been made powerless. So God allows your sin, my sin, to be placed on Jesus and Jesus pays the penalty of hell itself for that sin. 
And, we, and in this process is what we need to also grasp, is that sin, is that death is conquered. Death is, eternal death is conquered. Death has been conquered. And he who had the power of death has been destroyed. That is sin. That is Satan. Let me show you this. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at this in verse 54 to 57. Verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54 to 57. He says, but when this perishable, he says, but when this perishable, this corruptible, he says, when this perishable, this corruptible will have put on the imperishable, the, imp the incorruptible, then this mortal law will have put on immortality. Then will, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And so what happens, you remember in our last session that we were talking about this, the law of sin and death and the law of spirit and life. Remember that? So the law of spirit and life, okay, turns to the law of sin and death and it sucks it up completely. It just overwhelms it and defeats it. That's when I, not, that's why he asked Paul and he says, death is swallowed up in victory. Eternal death is swallowed up in victory for the believer. Look what he says in verse 5. He says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. That Remember that law? The law of sin and death. Okay? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the, Lord, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one who enables and embodies the spirit of life the spirit of life, right? Zoe, the spirit of eternal life. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, verse 6. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. And look what he says. He says this, For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. All of us were ungodly. He says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died now that word died there, look at that, underscore that word died. That word there is the word apothenesco. He said apothenesco. It's A O, it's A P O, A P O, T H, A P O, T H, N E S K O. A P O T H N E S K O, aponesco. Okay? Now, when, when he says here, Time, he says in verse 6, Romans chapter 5, For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died. Christ, apothenesco, when applied to Christ to die for or on account of sin, on account of sin, to make an atonement and satisfaction. This is what this word means. It means when, and when this word is applied to Christ, it means to die for or on account of sin. To make an atonement and satisfaction for it. To be dead to the law. To the law of sin and death. To have no more dependence upon mere legal righteousness for justification and salvation, and salvation than a dead man would have. As being self-crucified and dead together with Christ. That's what that little, little word there, died, means. Apothenesco in the original Greek language. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. He says this, For God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ apothenesco, Christ died for us. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. He says, For I delivered to you as of, as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died, apothenesco, for our sins according to the Scriptures. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. And he died, apothenesco, for all, so that, they who, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. And Christ redeemed, look at this word, Christ redeemed, underscore that word, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now, I want you to go back and underscore that word redeemed, okay? 
That word redeem in the Greek language is the word exagorazo. Exag exagorazo. Exagorazo. Okay, I'm going to spell it for you. It's in the Greek language. It's E X A E X A G. Okay, O R A Z O. E X A G O R A Z O. Exagorazo. Okay. And that word literally means, and the word generally means to buy up, to buy up, to buy up all that is anywhere to be bought, and not to allow the suitable moment to pass by by unheeded, but to make it as one's own. Okay, except except orazo. Okay, um, this is this is a this is actually a real estate transaction banking term. Okay. Somebody goes out and they buy up all the properties. They buy up all the land so nobody else can have it. Okay, and they take up all that land. Okay, so this is what Jesus did in the exagorazo. Okay, he brought up all the sins, and no one else could have him, not even Satan. That's the point here. So this word exagorazo, the word generally means to buy up, to buy all that is anywhere to be bought, and not to allow the suitable moment to pass by by un, by by unheeded, but to make it one's own. Used for our redemption by Christ is okay from the curse and the yoke of the law. So the same word is used to purchase a slave, exagorazo. To purchase the entire person of the slave. Christ purchased all of our sins. It doesn't even belong to Satan anymore. Are you getting the picture of why it's so important for us to understand and grasp the gospel? Turn your Bibles to the book of Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 verse 14. Titus chapter 2 verse 14. Who gave himself up to who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for God, he says, for, zealous for good deeds. Who gave himself up for us to redeem us. The, this is the work of Christ. But I don't deserve it. None of us deserve it. This is an act of sacrificial love of grace and mercy that is initiated by God unto us. Turn your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 9. Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 9. But we do see him, Christ, who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. He tasted the death that we deserve. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. He says, So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Now, preacher, listen to me, because I'm, a lot of the pastors are the ones who are tuning in to this. Okay? And you can take and extrapolate, you can take and extend this teaching out of every one of these verses that I'm teaching. Okay? Now, for, let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. 1 Peter 2, 24. He says, And he himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. You were saved. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, turn your Bibles there, please. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, he says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, and having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. 1 John chapter 3, 1 John not John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. Now look at this. This is our last verse. We're going to come this to a close here in this particular session. And our next session will be the ninth session. But let's conclude the eighth session here. And look what he says. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. For we know he we know love by this. For we know by love that he, he being Jesus, that's the pronoun, capital H. Okay, when you see a pronoun capitalized, it's a reference to God, reference to Jesus, a reference to the Holy Spirit, okay? Okay, and, and the context will tell us which one. He says, we know, we know love by this, that he's, that he laid, L-A-I-D, he laid 
down his life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That he laid down his life for us. Now that word laid them is the word in the Greek language, is the word tithimi. Tithimi, okay, it's a funny word in the Greek language, it's tithimi, and, and it's spelled T-I-T-H-E, T-I-T-H-E-M-I. T-H-T, I'm sorry, T-I-T-H-E-M-I, Tithemi, okay? And the word literally in the Greek language, it means to give one's life as a fundamental payment, as divinely ordained by God, okay? To purposely take another's place, another, another's place as ordained by God. Tithemi. Tithemi is, is, is what, this is where we get the, the concept, the doctrine of, the doctrine of substitution, Christ went to the cross and took your place because you deserve for him to take your place. No, because it was ordained by God the Father to theme me. Let me end with this thought one more time. It means to give one's life as a fundamental payment as divinely ordained by God. It means to purposely take another's place as ordained by God. That is the gospel. <laughs>